Well, thank you, uh, Magali, and uh, thank you, Mr. Cohen. We, um, I, I am going to uh, delve into this um, interesting connection here between um, tau and neurodegeneration as soon as I figure out the right button on the pointer. Um, so recently a group of us here, um, I put the title on the screen, uh, published a piece, a uh, perspective piece in science called Charting a Path Toward Understanding Neurodegeneration. And the basic point of this uh, piece is that um, we have a, a very um, deep understanding now uh, of cancer, but we have a very poor understanding of neurodegeneration. And why is that? Uh, in the field of um, cancer, although we don't have a cure, we really understand in a very uh, comprehensive manner why cells proliferate. We really don't know why cells die. And the discrepancy between these fields is striking. Um, it is the uh, point of this piece that uh, recently published that to make that kind of progress, we really need a considerably more fundamental understanding of the neurobiological, of um, the neurodegenerative processes. From a cell biological perspective, the same way that molecular biology contributed to uh, cancer understanding, we think that cell biology will form the fundamental understanding of neurodegeneration. So in that vein, I want to uh, point out here that um, conditions uh, that we're talking about here today, traumatic brain injury, are closely related to neurodegeneration. In the lower panel, you can see here I um, have the word CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is clearly a neurodegenerative condition, and it involves the tau protein as a centerpiece for all of these, for at least both of these conditions. Um, and uh, so this is a, a, a typical lesion there that you see in CTE. CTE is one of the long-term sequelae of uh, head injury, particularly repeated concussive injuries. So we have a number of black boxes. If you go up onto the top part of the slide, there are, uh, we know a number of the initiators. There are genetic defects that lead to neurodegenerative conditions. Um, a beta deposition, concussive injury we're talking about here today. There are many initiators, but then you go into this black box and out on the other side comes the neurofibrillary tangles. We don't understand all the in-between steps. And from the neurofibrillary tangles, we go into an even bigger black box because now these tangles and other phenomenology going on in the brain result in a clinical phenotype. We have to fill in what's going on in the black boxes. So to understand this, we have to um, try to work together. And disease categorization by one's profession is a problem because we're all looking uh, sort of like the blind man feeling the feet of the elephant. Um, we can see, we look at diseases by their gene mutations or their pathology, uh, clinical conditions, but mechanism is missing. And if you fill in those circles, we have long lists of mutations uh, associated with many neurodegenerative conditions, not just um, Alzheimer's and the tauopathies, but a number of uh, other conditions, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, I can go on and on. Um, and they're associated with certain uh, pathological pictures in the circle in the upper right, and a number of uh, clinical conditions, as you see down on the lower left. And from your point of view uh, that you take, you either call a disease a mutation in a gene or you call it a certain condition that has a, you know, a, a frontotemporal type of behavioral disorder, for instance, or a type of memory uh, problem. Mechanism, though, is missing. So let's move on to tau because tau does form a centerpiece for a lot of the conditions that we're talking about here today. It is um, not the only uh, protein involved in neurodegeneration, but it does seem to be the protein involved in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So at, from the time of Alzheimer, uh, if you go down to the lower panels, you can see that there are uh, neurofibrillary tangles there collecting in these uh, in pyramidal cells, forming inclusions. Um, Ta tau also collects in the neuropil, causing swollen dystrophic uh, neurites, as you see in the, middle, in the uh, middle panel. And if you go to the upper right, you can now look at tangles at the electron microscopic uh, level, the ultrastructural level, and they form filamentous structures. These are paired helical filaments that have a, an 80 nanometer periodicity. In the lower right panel, you can also see uh, tau uh, forming fibrils in vitro. And this has been a very informative way for us to understand the factors in a test tube that are leading toward the generation of, uh, of filaments. 
So some of the ideas now about how all this process, what's in that middle black box are going on is that you can see in the upper left, there's a tau wrapping around the microtubules. That's where tau belongs physiologically. But then it comes off and it starts to do a number of, uh, uh, becomes more problematic. One of the things that it does is it gets modified. It gets a lot of phosphorylations on it. And some of those phosphorylations may be involved in um, leading ultimately to tangles and to cell death. Phosphorylation has been studied a lot, and I won't talk too much about that. And, um, but when tau does get into trouble, or when almost any protein gets into trouble, there is a trash can in the cell called the proteasome where that is totally in charge of getting rid of these proteins that become abnormal. So a key um, uh, problem that is not understood in neurodegeneration is why it is when a protein misfolds and clearly becomes abnormal, and even becomes abnormal to the point that we can um, know the cell is recognizing it as abnormal because it's getting ubiquitinated, which is a protein that gets attached to proteins targeting it to the trash can. All of that happens, and yet the protein fails to be degraded. So why is the uh, waste disposal system failing in these cells? This is um, a central cell biological question that um, we don't understand. So the second point there is why does the cell not degrade tau as it does other misfolded proteins? And then we have to understand what are the biophysical properties of tau that predispose it to misfolding and spread? And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So these biophysical properties uh, can be studied in a test tube when we look at, as I mentioned, these uh, fibrils forming uh, in vitro. And there are a number of ways in which we can do this in test tubes. This has been known for a little while. Um, basically, the way they make tau uh, become abnormal in a test tube is to add uh, strong polyanions. And heparin is one of them, although the cell Inside the cell, you won't see heparin at all. So although it's very nice in a test tube, it does not seem to be the um, in vivo culprit. But um, it turns out that RNA is also a polyanion that can uh, induce tau assembly. And, um, and it's not, um, and, and tau now as a, a protein that is predisposed to misfold, tau falls into a larger category of proteins that also have this predisposition. We call these um, IDPs, or intrinsically disordered proteins, and tau is one of them. So these are really interesting set. There's a large number of them. Um, there are, they, they misfold. Amyloid uh, in Alzheimer's is one of them. And, and cancer, P53, is an intrinsically disordered proteins. These are proteins that, um, in contrast to a folded, a neatly folded protein, which you see in the figure uh, over on the left, the figure A, in which there is a nicely um, defined folding state in which all the protein is wrapped up in a way that's rather stable, the flattened structure that you see in B is what we call an IDP protein in which it's um, moving around constantly and forming many, many different conformations. So that the conformational landscape is now flatter and filled with um, hills and valleys, troughs. And some of these troughs can be places where a protein can fall into and uh, cannot get out of. So one possible trough, which, was, uh, which Eric mentioned in the previous uh, talk, happens to be the trough that a prion can fall into and fails to be able to climb out of that trough among multiple conformational states that are available to a, proton, to a protein. So I mentioned now that, um, we, that these um, many of the intrinsically disordered proteins are, have the property of binding to RNA. And again, you can begin to see where I'm going here. It's just, it's just sort of foreshadowing. I mentioned how RNA is, can induce misfolding of tau. So um, I'm going to another slide or two. I'm going to get to RNA and tau. But let me first introduce to you this category of proteins called RNA binding proteins. They are a subset of the intrinsically disordered proteins. That's point number one. And they constitute uh, a subset of them are particularly involved in neurodegeneration. So there are proteins known as TDP43 and FUS that are also involved in ALS and other neurodegenerative conditions that are RNA-binding proteins and intrinsically disordered. Tau seems to be in that category, which is actually uh, turning out to be quite interesting. And basically, in this sort of probably overly complex slide, 
Um, I'm showing you the data where using a technique that we call a uh, hits clip, we've now demonstrated that tau can bind to RNA in vivo in a cell. It has the ability to, um, to bind. There's an affinity between them that's quite tight, nanomolar uh, specificity. And uh, the particular RNA to which tau is binding is a tRNA. Um, so the um, uh, tRNAs uh, will find amino acids and uh, attach them to um, a nascent proteins. Now, so let me, so, uh, so before you look at this slide too much, let me just say where we are. We have tau binding to an RNA. We have this whole idea of intrinsically disordered proteins that are often RNA binding proteins that are, seem to be involved in neurogeneration. So just hold that in your mind for a moment, and let's now move over to, instead of these biophysical phenomena, start to talk about cell biology again. And so there's a structure that um, we defined, uh, actually you can see here's the references from our lab back as early as 1996 called RNA granules. These are really curious structures. They move around um, RNA in cells, ribosomes, they move cohesively, but as you can see in the electron microscopic image on the right where there's an arrow, there's no membrane around them. So how can a cluster of things, in uh, RNAs and proteins and ribosomes, be moving cohesively when they're not bound by a membrane? And so there, these granules come in different forms. Um, Paul Anderson, who uh, Dr. Kandel also mentioned, describes stress granules. That's another one of these um, uh, types of species. And um, they're, they, so they have this property of just being able to move. But although this, uh, this work was done from a purely out of pure cell biological interest, um, we did not really, we, we missed the boat on how it is possible that a structure within the cytoplasm is somehow staying cohesive without a membrane. And the person that figured it out was Steve McKnight, not too long ago, who said that these particular structures form a distinct phase state, a liquid-liquid phase state within the cytoplasm. That there is, just like you have oil and water, these are droplets that can move through the cytoplasm, but they're very, very different than oil and water because both are clearly in a, in a state in which small molecules can move in and out. Oil does not allow any water to get in. But water can pass through here, and I'm going to tell you in a moment what holds them together. So the next sort of problem here from a cell biological perspective that we're sort of leading up to is that um, tau has the very interesting property of being in axons. It's, um, it's, it's a, certainly a neuronal protein, but it is within a special domain in the uh, neuron, the axon, that where the action potential is propagated, whereas the axon tends to exclude RNA for the most part, in, uh, particularly in mammals. And RNA tends to be in dendrites. However, in neurodegeneration, tau will often move into the dendrites where it can now become exposed to RNA and possibly um, interact, as I've just uh, mentioned. So back to an in vitro setting again here where we can actually show now that not only does tau interact uh, with RNA in vivo, but so far, we haven't been able to show this in vivo yet, but in vitro, we can show that the tau and RNA form these uh, droplet uh, complexes. And if you look at the lower panel, they, are, uh, they can be titrated with different salt concentrations. And I'll show you why that is important in a moment. Um, the, uh, we can also calculate the stoichiometry of the binding between tau and RNA. There's um, about a uh, two to one. You can see in the middle panel there, there are those um, white blobs where we uh, uh, talk about uh, where, where there's free tau and above it is tau at different um, mass ratios in which one uh, tau or two or three, four, five can be binding to an RNA and those ratios are in different multiples so that there's a number of different mass ratios by which tau can bind to RNA, but in all the cases, the, um, they are electrostatically one-to-one. -one. You basically, uh, tau binds so that the electrostatic charge is neutralized, but the mass ratios can be higher. And um, this now is um, a chemist have known about this relationship for a while, this kind of situation where 
two molecules of opposite charge bind perfectly and create this kind of electrostatic environment that can, that's been called a coacervate. So, the, um, so here we have the model where if you look at the center, there is tau and tRNA binding. And if you go over to the right, they can form these complexes when they're in perfect electrostatic balance and now form exactly what I was talking about a moment ago, the kind of granule that uh, can exist in cells in which proteins and RNA can move cohesively within the cytoplasm by setting up a perfect charge balance between the two. And this, is a, this is a novel state of tau now that we're describing. This is not tau, uh, uh, no longer on the microtubule. This is tau sitting in perfect charge balance to RNA in which it can move cohesively around the cell. And these kinds of granules are really interesting because, by the way, um, you know, during Dr. Kandel's talk, I, I, you know, the, um, the protein that he was very interested in, TIA, is, by the way, also an RNA binding protein that has been implicated in granules. So this, the, the cat, we're coming at, at this uh, problem from many directions and forming a kind of cohesiveness here, which is always lovely. Now, how do you get from this physiologic interaction between tau and the RNA to an actual irreversible reaction in which you go and you, you see down at the bottom there, there's irreversibility where tau is now going to become a, f a form into a fibril that can no longer reverse back to these other states. I think that's the kind of direction we want to uh, move toward now that we understand there is a distinct cellular state in which tau can exist and a state in which it is likely, because of the company it's keeping, be vulnerable to form fibrils. Okay. Last couple of slides, I want to change the topic a little bit because we've had a little bit of discussion here about um, uh, the utility or non-utility of uh, animal models. So I'm going to show you now some um, way in which we can actually use human cells. These are human iPS neurons, induced pluripotent stem cells taken from humans and differentiate them to neurons and put them on a microelectrode array and actually watch uh, the behavior of human neurons now. So um, in this um, particular, so uh, I'm obviously changing topics a little bit, but I want to actually uh, show you how this tool that we've built can be quite useful for, again, studying problems related to uh, tau uh, pathobiology. So basically, the, the unit consists in that where that blue light is in the center of the picture is where the microelectrode array is. Underneath it are electrodes coming in from above as a kind of glorified pipette that can pick up individual cells and do their RNA sequencing in single cells, can measure them physiologically, can do a lot of features, and uh, we generate the raster plot that you see down below, which is the firing rates of the neurons on the array. And here, you can see um, in the center panel is where all the firing is lined up, and there are a number of peaks. There are depolarizations that line up in one electrode precisely at the same time relative to a set of others over and over and over again, a thousand iterations of a, of a depolarization, a spike coming along. And if you track them out, you get to where those red dots are. Those red, and the, the time difference between each one of those spikes as you go down, to the look at the depolarization, depolarization, the deflection in the panel to the far right, those are sub-millisecond differences. What we're basically seeing is the propagation of an action potential going down an axon here uh, uh, over the array. This is really something you can't see by patch clamp. You can't see this in any other way. And as I mentioned, tau is really an axonal protein that is lying in the, uh, is in the axon, and there is, um, it's perfectly reasonable to think that we can try to mesh now the um, the, the pathobiology of tau at the protein level with dysfunction at the physiological level, which is, by the way, where we have to get, um, in using uh, this kind of system. And the system actually is, um, uh, because we have this uh, device sitting on top, this neural circuit probe, we call it, sitting on top that can actually pinpoint any single neuron on the array, we can actually drop TTX um, onto a single neuron and as you can see there where those red firings stop abruptly, we put the TTX on a single neuron and now we can stop the depolarization down the entire axonal track. So that, that really gives us a means here with this tool to probe 
um, axonal physiology running over a considerable uh, distance. I think this is going to be very, very useful. One can imagine how you can use these arrays by sending a shock wave through the uh, fluid medium and looking at disruption, how you can get tau into these neurons and actually watch there's, uh, how problems may evolve in the conduction of the signal, how you can genetically manipulate the neurons here and also get disruption of the sing signal. So. Um, Here's the group that has, uh, has done all this. Um, this is, uh, we have uh, basically two groups that are involved uh, here. One that's focusing more on the physiology, which you can see on the upper level there. And the person over on the far right um, is Paul Hansma, who actually was one of the persons who first built the atomic force microscope and has helped us to build the instrumentation I just uh, described. And in the lower group is um, more of our uh, cell molecular biology group. In the picture, in the inset picture, is Sang Hee Han, who has um, helped uh, us to learn about the physical chemistry here involving um, coacervates and uh, entities such as that. Thank you very much. I'm told there's time for one question. Who wants to be on the spot for the one question? <laughs> yes. local translation of RNAs is very important for memory formation and this could be a way that tau aggregation with RNA could have a premature effect on memory before the whole cell goes down. So we are absolutely fascinated by that topic and I thank you for that question. One of the definitions of uh, an RNA granule is, is that the RNA in the granules is translationally silenced. So what's basically what we think is actually happening is, is that um, the RNA granule is a vehicle to get the RNA to the synapse and then through depolarization at the synapse you now release the silencing in some way that still we have to better understand. <laughs>